Yeah. Any questions? Okay. So in this last lecture, we're going to be talking about how to compile an actual programming language. Oops, you want video? <coughs> into actual machine instructions. So the language, for historical reasons, is called SL3, simple language number three. And so it's an imperative language, not a functional language. To keep things simple, we're not having functions as, as values in this language at all, because otherwise I'd have to be able to compile into closures, and that's, that's more work. Um, all variables hold integers, all functions have integer parameters and integer return type. So I have expressions in the usual way with uh, arithmetic operations and with function calls. Um, it's, we have mutable state, so we have assignments. A variable can be assigned any expression. I have a branch statement uh, with an if, and it's just the seesaw notation, parentheses, then the positive part of the branch, and an optional else with a negative branch. Now inside, and only inside a branch, or as you'll see in a minute, a while statement, I can have conditions, and the conditions have a relational operator where you have an expression, and a relation, and another expression, and the relation is one of the six kind of normal relations. So. Nothing very surprising there. So these things actually are Boolean expressions, and that's the only place where you can use Boolean expressions. For simplicity, I'm, simplicity, I'm not supporting Boolean variables. Just <coughs> keeps the code simpler. Over here you see the stat, that's a statement. Um, a statement can be a simple statement, uh, just like an assignment. It can be a block, that's a sequence of statements and closed embraces. And of course, it can be an if or a while statement. So it's exactly like in C. Then we have the while statement. That's the only repetition statement that we support because, of course, things like for and do while could always be written in terms of while. Um, and so it has the, the same form as in C, while, then some Boolean expression. And this is the only Boolean expression that we support. And then a statement, which again can be a simple statement or a block statement with braces. So we need the while. Um, in SL1, we didn't have a while, because in SL1, we had recursion. And here we do, well, I guess technically I could, I could somehow try to get by with recursion. But it, it, while is, is actually easy to do, and it's in the spirit of this uh, kind of simple, non-functional language. So functions are also simple. Uh, to keep parsing simple, the form is somewhat reduced. Um, we don't specify the types of the parameters and return values because they're all int. So we have the name of the function, name of the first parameter, name of the second parameter, and so on. Then we have a block and closed embraces. Um, all variables have to be declared at the top of the function. And for simplicity, I initialize them all with zero. Later, you can assign something else to them with an assignment statement, but um, they're, they're all here. Then we have any sequence of statements of the ones that you've seen on the pre previous slide. And then we return some expression. The return has to be the last statement. You can't have a return in the middle. Of course, you can always save whatever it is that you wanted to return in a variable and then flow out to the end and then return it. So the return in the middle is not, never an essential feature. And here's how you can avoid it. Um, and again, it's just to make the parsing as simple as possible. So here is an example program. Um, as you can imagine, execution starts in main. We're not supporting any command line arguments here. Um, main needs to return something just, again, for, for uniformity. And uh, it doesn't matter what it returns. 
and then main like any other function can do stuff. Here it calls print. Print is a special function that I that comes as a freebie. So every SL3 program has a print function that's, that's predefined. But we don't have anything like libraries or linking or any such thing. Um, oh, we'll just generate a code for one print function. Since all we ever have is integers, the print function can only print an integer. So here we're printing three factorial. So this nesting of functions is, of course, supported. And here's the factorial function. It has two variables, f and i, initialized with 0. But then I actually want them to be initialized as 1, and I have to write that as assignment statements. So there's no syntax for saying var f equals 1. Would be an easy thing to do. You know, might be the kind of thing that I would ask you to do on an, on an exam. Um, so we have, in, this, in the sequence of statements, we have these three statements, two assignments, and then a while loop. So this while loop does you know, how you compute factorials the old-fashioned way by just multiplying up the factors and incrementing them by one. And then you finally return the answer back here. So that's all that you need to know about SL1 to, to program in it. Now, how do we compile it? So we want to generate Java bytecodes, because uh, that's what we've learned to do. We'll use the BCEL library. That makes most of us relatively painless. We'll write a single class that contains all of the SL3 code that the pro uh, programmer provided. And then we translate each of the functions that the programmer provided into a Java function. So we'll have a function called main. Uh, without arguments, to be that's why it's different from the main with the st uh, string array. We have a function fact, and they will just become static methods. Then we add a public static void main that calls the main without arguments and does nothing else. And then we also supply that print method that we need to get some results. So this is just a toy thing, so we don't provide anything for reading input. You just have to rerun the pr uh, program with, with different uh, variable values if that's what you want to do. And the whole thing is about 250 lines of Scala, um, as we'll see when we go through this. Um, those 250 lines are about equally divided between parsing, or maybe not. There's, there's more about interpreting than parsing. So yeah, actually, let's have a very quick overview of what it does. So here we have it. So we have a bunch of definitions of these case classes. So hopefully, this one is on coming back into your memory now. Um, the parser produces a tree that's made up of the structural elements of the program. So you have a program that contains a sequence of functions. We have a function. Where's a fund def? It's here. The function has a name, a list of parameters, um, the list of variable definitions, a list of statements, and all the end, and all the way at the end, an expression of the of the re that's the return expression. So that's what a function is parsed into, and like an assignment has the variable name on the right, the expression that's being assigned. Um, a while statement has the condition, that's a Boolean operator, and then the block, that's the body of it. Um, a block has a list of statements. So it's all kind of straightforward. Um, the parser you know, looks like you know, a whole bunch of parsing code like you've, you've always seen here. It's like how to parse a while statement. We eat the while, we eat the parentheses, the condition, the, other, uh, the closing uh, parentheses, uh, and the block. And then we translate it into you know, exactly the while statement with the things that we just harvested. So this is exactly like what we've done with SL1 parsing just now with a slightly different language. So the fun begins when we now translate um, the parse tree into code generation. And so we're going to go through that um, a little bit. There, the most important part are is there is a uh, code of stat that translates a statement. And then there's a code off that translates that an expression. So let's look at those more closely on the slides. So when we have an arithmetic expression, 
Um, as you know, that gets parsed into a tree structure. And <coughs> so here I have an example where I'm computing 3 plus 4 times 5. Um, so the program text was 3 plus 4 times 5. We translate that into this parse tree that shows that the multiplication has to come first. And now we want to translate this expression. Well, it's an operator expression, right? An operator expression has an expression on the left, an expression on the right, and the operator on top. And here's how we translate it. We produce the code of the left side that produces some instructions whose final result is to have the left side appear on the top of the step. We produce the code of the right side that makes some number of instructions that when executed leave the right side on the stack, on the top of the stack. So now after both the left side and the right side code have been executed, you will have the left argument and the right argument as the top two values of the stack. And then you need to create the, the operation. In this case, there would be an I mall to evaluate the two, or up here you would do an I add. And so as it happens, the create binary operation, um, <coughs> we will take a string that contains the Java operator, the string containing plus or asterisk, and then it'll translate that into the right I mod or I add or, or whatever the right operator is for that symbol. So we must take advantage of that uh, of that niftiness, and we can just take the operator that we have here, which is just the string plus or minus or whatever, and put it right in here. Now this is a little bit different than the operator that you had in the case of the SL1 parser. In that case, the operator took the left subtree, the right subtree, and a function to combine the values. In this case, it's just the string that says what should be happening. Because after all, we don't want to evaluate at translation time. We, we wouldn't want to generate code to be executed later. So here's the example on how this works out. Um, I want to produce instructions for the parse tree that you see here. Um, I translate the left. The left has a three, and that gets, as you'll see on the next slide, translated to an instruction icons three. That pushes the constant three understand. Then we need to translate the right hand side. So recursively, that'll produce the red instructions that you see here, icons four, icons five, and imol. Uh, when because that's what the recursive call gives us. And then in the original call, we get an I add out of um, the plus that's on top. So no matter how complex the stream may be, it just recursively generates these stack instructions, and it'll always work out. So that's not really hard. So what about other expressions? Well, <coughs> we have like constants. Um, and take it to translate into iconst. So any literal constant turns into an iconst. Uh, what about variables? If you have like the variable in somewhere, then you need to push n on the stack. Now, that means we need to generate an i load. An i load takes the slot number of the variable. And so we have to have a way of translating a string such as n into the right slot number. So the mechanism for that is mildly convoluted. As it turns out, the method gen object that you use to generate the code in a method keeps track of the names of the variables and their slot numbers, and we can then ask it. So we have to ask the method gen, give me your list of local variables. In that list, we want to find the variable whose name is the given name. So here is find. Um, find returns an option. That option, as long as it has some, something in there, and we're doing no error checking, so we're simply assuming it has something in there. So then it gets us a sum of the match. And then that match has the index, which we need, and it also has the type. Um, it, it, superficially, it, you would think you would need the type because everything is, is integer, but it just was just as simple to do that. Uh, I could have just put integer here as well. So, <clears throat> last time I complained a little bit about it said, why do I even have to do this? Why can't instruction factory.create load do all of this? And I still believe that that would 
be ideally possible with a better API, but this is the API that was handed to us. So for a, a variable with a given name, uh, this mumbo jumbo will give us the correct iLoad instruction. What about function calls? Well, what's a function? A function has a list of arguments that need to be evaluated, and then it has a name so that we can call it. Um, so the list of arguments is an, is an args. We need to evaluate each of them by calling code of so that it generates the code that evaluates that argument. So this one uh, line of code will produce the code for evaluating each argument pushed on the stack. Now on the stack, all the arguments are there in order, and we need to generate the instruction to, to call the function. So that's uh, create invoke. That creates a function invocation. We need the class name. We need the function name. Um, the return type is, is always int. All of the parameter types are int. And here's my lazy way of generating a list of n ints. When I have n parameters, I just take all of the parameters and map them to int without even looking at them. Um, there's got to be some, some other w way of doing that, but this seemed easy. And then it's a static function because all of the functions that we generate are static methods. So um, what about print? I need to generate print by hand, and I didn't put that on the slides, but we'll find that somewhere uh, at the very end here. Here I'm just adding a function print, and I've just coded up by hand what it means to call system out print. Now let's compile <coughs> um, branches and loops. We'll start with branches. So if I have an if statement, it gets parsed into this guy here. It's an if statement, has a Boolean operator that re relates the two expressions with some relational operator, and then has a body for the positive part, and maybe it has a body for the negative part. Now how do I translate it into machine instructions? I need to evaluate the first expression. I evaluate the second expression, and then I subtract the two, and that way I get a value that is negative, zero, or, or positive, and then I use this relation here. Let's say that I wanted to have an expression that says, if n is greater than zero. Well, let's say greater than one, so that the subtraction becomes more meaningful. So I say, so n is greater than one. Then I evaluate n, then I evaluate one, I subtract them. Now I have n minus one. And now if n minus 1 is greater than 0, that means that n is greater than 1, then I want to go to the loop. But if n minus 1 is not greater than 0, then I want to go, no, not to the loop, I want to go to the positive part. When it's not greater than, than 1, then I want to go to this part here. So now I'm inverting the relation, so um, we'll see in a minute how to actually do that. So when the inverted relation is true, then I want to jump past the body and go to body to the optional body 2. On the other hand, uh, if that's not the case, I want to flow through the body, and then I want to go past body 2. So I need to uh, to make these two jump points. I've put in here an, an no op instruction. So NOP is a special bytecode for an instruction that does nothing. It's a convenient loop target. Yes? Is if stat only meant to support like numbers? Or? What's that? Is if stat supposed to only support numbers? Yes. So. So the, well, if stat is what the if statement that you see back, where is it? Yeah. So this statement here uh, only supports conditional expressions of this restricted form. Okay. All right. So. So for, for these two branch targets, I've, I have a no-op here. That way, it's, it's easier to generate code. If you recall, if whenever you have a branch target, you have to find out exactly where it is so that you can feed the value of it into the, the branch instruction. So I have you know, this branch instruction and this branch instruction that needn't have the value. And that way, uh, the, the code to make that is a little easier. It's, it's mildly wasteful, but I don't care. So that's kind of my cheat sheet here of what I want to produce. And now, how do I do it? I do exactly what it says here. I call code off to generate the code for the first expression. Code off for the second expression. Then I subtract them. That's the subtraction instruction. 
now I have my conditional branch. A conditional branch, um, you have to give it um, the relation that you want to branch on. And I'm making myself a little map that you see down here, where if I had like a greater, then I translate that into the opposite, and that's less or equal, because I want to negate the relation here. So this way I get the, the correct opposite out of this pre-computed table here. Um, so that's my branch. I need to remember where that branch is, because later on, once I know where this no-op falls, then I need to patch it up. So eventually, you know, I, I do the body. I translate this body into whatever. And then I'm reaching this point here where I have the label once. I generate an op. And whatever the location of that was, that becomes the branch target for the branch that I've set up here. So that's mildly tedious, but not that badly. So what about a while loop? It's really the same thing, just a little simpler. Because for a while loop, you do the same thing on the top, where you have a Boolean, exp or Boolean uh, relation here. So I evaluate the first expression. The second one, subtract, do my branching thing. As it turns out, I again have to invert the branch relation to skip <coughs> out of the loop when the condition is false. <coughs> Then I translate the body, and at the end of the body, I have an unconditional branch that goes back to the top. And that's what a loop does. You go through the body, and then you go back to the top and evaluate the condition again. So that again is done really by writing down what I just told you. So you generate the, the top. You, you need to remember where that was, because at the very end, when we have the go to, we, we want to go back to that point. And uh, this is exactly what we've seen before, really word by word. And then we need to translate the body into code, and that's what code of block does. And I haven't uh, shown you everything about code of block, but it is completely mechanical. All it does is it generates uh, the, the variables, it generates all the code for all of the assignments, and for all of the statements of the block. It recursively calls code of block on those, and then it generates the return instruction. And we're not going to go through that in detail. Um, well, uh, what if you like kind of wrote all your pre-test loops as just do whiles, but if I can check at the first step? Well, if you wanted to do a, a, like a, a, a do while, then you would translate it. Yeah. Because, um, okay, so having an unconditional jump back top, you just like have a conditional up top. And so then there's only like one jump per loop. And again. How, how would you get to one time? I mean, you have to, when the condition is false, you have to go somewhere, and you have to go past the end of the loop. Well, in that loop, you have the if not rel go to, and then you yeah. have the unconditional go to. Yeah. So it's like two per loop, but you make it do while. If you wanted to support a do while loop, then you could, right? We would then have to come up with syntax for it. We would then come up with a do stat. I mean, like a generated as if it was do while, but also place an initial like if statement at the top before the do. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, are you asking uh, what if you wanted to translate a do loop, or you want to improve the code generation of the while loop? Can improve the code generation. I don't think you can do it with a single jump. Um, well, because even if you were to test the condition at the bottom, then you'd first have to jump to the bottom. Well, could you do a do-while loop with a single jump? Yes. With a do-while loop, you could do ex um, you, you could do that, right? You could first jump to the bottom, do the thing. No, you still need to. No, I, I, I haven't thought it through. So with do-while, okay, you flow through. Yeah, maybe with a do-while, you could do a single. So then while just be if this yeah but the if then has an implicit uh, the if takes a, a, a jump so as well right yeah yeah I, I yeah I don't think that the, you can cut down on the go on the number of jumps there um, 
Okay, so the point is, now you really know everything that you need to know to write a compiler. This is what a compiler does. It parses the program into a, a, a bunch of trees, and then it recurses down the trees, generating instructions as it goes along. Yeah? How is this different from the interpreter that we created a while ago? Well, the interpreter, if you remember, was uh, <coughs> it didn't produce anything. It just executed the program. This thing will write a file with Java bytecodes. Oh, okay. So yeah, this thing will will not run. In, it's just like a compiler doesn't execute the program. Yeah. It generates Java bytecodes, and this this thing will do exactly the same thing. So if we look at the, the end of it, it's going to um, let's see if we can find main. Def 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 def. Here it generates. Here, the very last line of main is to dump the class file. And that's all it does. If you want to run the program, as you'll see in the lab, then you have to find where the class file is, and then you run it by feeding it to the JVM. Yeah. yeah so, um, so it is in this regard completely different from SL1. Where no, we didn't leave any trace, we, s we just executed the program um, by also by recursively looking at the generated data structures. So in the lab, we're going to be kicking the tires of this. Um, but I thought before that, it would be good to gloat a little bit to see what we've achieved uh, with, <coughs> with these programs. So both in SL1 and SL3, we used the combinator parser that's a part of Scala to turn the program text into a tree structure. So you now know how to parse the text of a programming language into a tree structure that you then can do to do something useful. And it's not that hard a thing to do, right? So when you look at the, the code up here, that you know, at this point should you know, look vaguely familiar where you have these <coughs> these definitions that are basically a reflection of the grammar. You can write the grammar in BNF and then you translate it into the Scala code. And that's really what any compiler writer would do. Uh, the Java grammar is of course larger. Uh, it, it doesn't fit on a single uh, cocktail napkin but you know, it'll take up pages and pages. And you probably wouldn't want to translate them into a Scala combinator parser, you would be using a, <coughs> a, a faster uh, parser that makes it easier to do th niceties such as error checking. Um, like there's a, a system called Antler that's, uh, that many people use. You can get an Antler grammar for Java and then feed it to Antler, then you, it spits out a parser that you then can use for your purposes. And it's not really any more difficult than what you've seen here. So uh, it wouldn't take you long to learn that uh, at all. If you take a course in compiler construction, <coughs> they, they will walk you through the details. But you know the basics. Now, then in SL1, we evaluated the um, parse tree as we saw. You now know how to evaluate expressions. Uh, an expression tree has nodes that have the operators, and you evaluate the left, you evaluate the right, you combine the result with the operator. Same thing with generating code. You generate code for the left, you generate code for the right, you generate code for the operator that combines the two. Um, when you have variables, that complicates your uh, translation a bit. Um, so you have to keep track of the variables in a symbol table. A symbol table in an interpreter holds the name and the value of each variable. The uh, symbol table for a compiler would hold the name and the type of each variable. You're not tracking values at, at <coughs> when your compiler runs because you have to wait for the program to be there. When you have variables, you have scope. Um, and you now know how to deal with scope. You use different tables for different places in the program. And you set it up like that, that if you have a, that uh, the, the innermost tables, they shadow what might go on in the other tables. And when you're done with an inner scope, you just pop off that table, and then you still have the outer tables. You've learned how to uh, implement closures. So a closure is a piece of code plus the bindings of the free variables. So that's uh, an interpreter, that's the code, and it's a table for 
the values, the names and the values of the free variables. And <coughs> um, I will remind you actually for the final to go back to, uh, to the slides of the SL1 interpreter where that magic moment is where we dealt with closures because there'll be some question about that. Um, if you wanted to do closures in a compiler, you would need to find some way of binding together the code and the variables. And in Java, uh, like in the Java virtual machine, the easiest way to do that is to translate a closure into an object. It would have a single method, that's the code, and the, it would have instance variables, and those are your free variables. And then when you, when you launch the closure, you stick the values of the free variables into the instance variables and let the code run. So you've seen how to interpret, you've seen how to generate code, and the interpreter was what, 200 lines of code? This one is 250 lines of code. Well, the reason why the compiler is kind of long is for one thing, I've put in these comments here, so that blows it up. And then you know, just the tedium of generating main and print takes two screens. Um, but it's not really any complexity. So you can see that the essence of these things is pretty, is pretty simple. And it's kind of amazing how simple it is. But on the other hand, think about it. Now, 50 years ago, people wrote compilers when they had like 4K of main memory. And so a compiler you know, is an amazing thing, but it's not actually that complicated. So you might say, what else does the Java compiler do that you don't know how to do? And essentially nothing. You know, you could write the entire Java compiler if you had infinite time. Um, what the Java compiler does, of course, deal with is things like the classes and fields and exception handling and um, <coughs> packages and num modules and all of that thing. And it, it's complicated in some way, but it's not that complicated. The biggest thing that the Java compiler does that we've never bothered with is error checking. Probably a large fraction of the code base in Java C is error handling to give the programmer meaningful error messages when the programmer does something wrong. We've not done that at all, right? And when in SL1 or SL3 you feed a program that doesn't work, it crashes in some way. Um, so that's, that's of course something that, that you'd want to do a better job at. But you now know how the, the, these, the, the basics of these you know, really fundamental tools, how, how they implement it, and it, it's not, not really that difficult. Part of the reason, of course, it's not really that difficult is that we stand on the shoulders of Scala here. Right? We have a very concise way of writing the parser by using the, co the combinator parser. And um, <coughs> a lot of the, the implementation is short because we can use functional programming that makes uh, really short work out of tasks that if you had to write them in an imperative language, it would take quite a bit longer. So, <coughs> and that you know, brings me to, to the last slide that I have here. So it's the last lecture. So we get to think about, you know, what did we achieve in the entire course? So if you go back uh, a few months ago, you knew nothing about functional programming, maybe, or maybe you did. Um, <coughs> but you know, we just started with functional programming. And at the time, maybe it was an odd concept to say, we want functions as, uh, as values that we manipulate in our programs. Why do you want to manipulate functions? But uh, you've learned how to deal with recursion, and more importantly, with higher order functions. So now, I hope that when I give you exam questions where you have to use recursion and, and maps and folds, that that'll have become more or less second nature. You've seen that mutable state is not really necessary at all. So in the entire course, um, we've not done any mutation. You know, all the homeworks, I said no mutation. There's only one part in the course where I could not avoid using a var. And that, if you remember, is in SL1, when you define a recursive function. The trouble with a recursive function is that the environment, the symbol table for it, must also contain the definition of the function that I'm about to do. And to do that, um, there's no simple way of setting it up without making that one mutation. So it's a little bit strange, actually, that uh, in order to give you recursion, which is what really is what makes the, this pure programming possible with recursion, you couldn't 
do anything. You couldn't do loops or uh, <coughs> that kind of repetition. To give you the recursion, to make it possible for you to do programming without mutable state, I had to have one bit of mutable state. So it's that strange. Um, the, it is possible, actually, not to do that uh, with the Y combinator, but it is very complex and, and not something that you would actually want to do. So, so we've learned a lot about uh, <coughs> all of this. And then we took uh, a few detours um, that also taught us some other things. We talked about types, not for as much as I would have liked, but there's only so much time in the course. And that's kind of two takeaways that, uh, from types. So for one thing, um, having types, and particularly having compile time type checking, is hugely valuable. That compile time type checking uh, it really beats not having compile time type checking because you get a lot better error messages. Um, they're much faster to fix. And so it <coughs> the, the trend is definitely that you want compile time typing. Um, why don't we always get compile time typing? Because there's some things that are hard to express so that programmers can wrap their head around it. If you remember the first lecture that we had on types uh, and type variants, where well, we talked about co and contravariant and pluses and minuses. And you may also remember the wildcards in Java that try to achieve the same thing with the question mark extends and question mark super. This is not something that the blue collar programmer has an easy time with. Um, <coughs> and so it's necessary if you want to have guarantees that nothing bad can happen at runtime. But somehow the feeling is it ought to be possible for these types to be more automatically ascribed so that they don't rise up to something that, that you see in the program text. And so in some languages, that is in fact the case. In Haskell, for example, you don't have to, to write any of those types. They all get inferred. So it's completely type safe, but all of the type inference happens uh, at, at compile time and is invisible to the programmer. And so there's some hope that in future languages, we'll get better at designing type systems where we can deal with things like variants that are less in the face of what the programmer has to see. And so you might you know, t tell your children that when you were young, you had to deal with, well, with question mark extends and plus t and those things. And your children will laugh and not know what you're talking about. So that would be the hope, right? So, <coughs> so types are great, and how to make types more uh, more useful for programmers, that's, that's something that we'll all be watching. The other thing is that types are, in fact, so great that we want to be able to encode other properties into types that the programming language hasn't thought of. So, for example, you may have a type of strings that you know is, say, is localized, that's translated into the correct language. Or you may have a type of strings that represent instructions that you know have not been tampered with so that you can't have injection attacks. Um, or any number of other properties that you may want to, uh, to encode in the type system. And so we've had one lecture about these, th these advanced types that you can do with Scala, uh, those heterogeneous lists. And it's kind of amazing that it works. So we were able in Scala to encode properties that were not, we didn't use any of the tools of Scala. We built our own type system. Um, the downside of it is it is so difficult to do that with today's tools that this is not something that most people would want to attempt. There are libraries out there that give us things such as type safe interfaces to SQL in Scala. But the poor programmers who had to do that, they had to write all of that horrible code that, that you suffered through through one lab and uh, have probably repressed uh, now. And so that's another open question. How is that stuff going to get easier for us? And undoubtedly, that will happen, that we will use programming languages that make this easier in the future. And then <coughs> we spent a bit uh, with, with, uh, with Racket that I didn't put on here. Um, and the, uh, the point of Racket was really to show that uh, code is data, that it is useful to be able to, to process code as data. And so we, we looked a little bit at macros for, for that. Um, and then I put in the, the prologue thing, because I always love doing the, the prologue module, because uh, you, know, you start out with you know, what are facts and what are rules, 
And it's such an obvious thing that uh, what facts and rules are, and you look at the code for a pen, and it's so clear that it simply must be true, and uh, all these other things. But it's amazing that it is a Turing pro uh, complete programming language, and you can program anything that you want to with facts and rules. Uh, but it's really kind of mind-bending, as you know. Like you've suffered through those, those homeworks, and you know you scratch your head and say, "I know what I want to do. I want to you know why all this thing is true. I want to do this and this and this and this." And you can't because all your tools are facts and rules. And how do you shoehorn what you know how to do into this completely foreign uh, execution environment? And so it is amazing that you can do it. And so I hope that you find that instructive to know that you know there's completely different ways of thinking about programming than what we what we do every day. And so <coughs> the, the whole idea here is that you get a bit of a better view of what programming languages are about because we all use programming languages every single day. Um, whenever there's a new language out there, we ask, should I learn it? Uh, you know, it's Swift and uh, <coughs> uh, the, the latest incarnations of JavaScript and all of that. And so you know, they have new features. We, we want to eyeball what those features can do. Is this a, a good career move to go there? And for sure, the programming language that you will use in, at the end of your career will not be the same language that you used at the beginning of your career. And so you want to be prepared to, to learn new languages. Um, the first language that I learned uh, was Fortran. And I hope never again to have to use it. Um, and so um, you may you know, at, later on say the same thing about Java or Scala or whatever. All right. so. So that's kind of what, uh, what we went through, and I hope you enjoyed it, um, and that you fe feel you got your money's worth. Um, there's two more things that I hope that everyone got a glimpse on that you know, aren't really slide-worthy things, but I wanted to talk about them for a minute. The one thing that I was very gratified that it by and large worked out is that I got everyone to type in commands into a terminal. Um, at the beginning of the class, I think, I think about more than half of the students were not comfortable with that. And so we're now at the point where I can say, you want to have your homework regraded, you know, here are the terminal instructions that the grader does, and it's completely reproducible. You do it in a temp directory, you issue these commands, and, uh, and, and it works. And that is a hugely important skill whenever you want to learn something new. Whenever I need to install a new system, I go to some some, um, some blog or some, some tutorial or something. And what I will find is not a bunch of screenshots and say, let's say click here, click here, click here. I will get a bunch of instructions that say type this thing into a terminal because it's just so much more reproducible. If something goes wrong, I get a text error message, I can throw that into Stack Overflow. And it is so much better than it's just not working. So that's really a, an important skill. Yes? So a lot of people I mean, I'm going to guess that a lot of people like these YouTube video instructions like that. But I know what you're saying. I've seen so many YouTube video how to get this code thing working. <laughs> yeah. Why? I'd much rather read some instructions well, like step by step. At some point, you will get, get to be like me, and you'll be so busy that you don't have time. Right. To work because it takes 20 minutes to go through the YouTube instructions. It takes me two minutes to, to exactly. scan through a bunch exactly. of text and, and see where the hiccup is. Right, we're only really need a little portion of it, not the whole Yeah, and it's, it's like watching the, the YouTube video of the girl twisting the cube. Um, I mean, it took me a long time to actually figure out what she was twisting. Um, and so YouTube is great for certain things when, when it's something visual. And like for something like to drive an ID, sometimes it actually is more effective to just watch someone than it is to uh, see a cumbersome uh, description of, yeah, look at the plus sign on the rightmost edge. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, ha having, the, uh, ha having the command line interface really is, is valuable. And so I'm glad that I've gotten everyone over the hump uh, with that, even though it wasn't always pleasant. Um, the other thing that I'm really, really hoping that everyone is going to internalize is that when you learn something new, something that you've never done before, give yourself time that if it's something that, that you know, your brain needs to change and your, your fingers are not yet used to it, Give it a few days, do a little bit the first day, do a little bit the next day, do a little bit the, th the third day, and that way on the seventh day when it's due, then you're not all nervous. 
and your brain has adapted to a whole bunch of things. And so that, uh, I can't overemphasize how important that is in the life of anyone who needs to learn new technology at a rapid clip. Pace yourself, do a little bit every day, and then you can, uh, can do uh, with pleasure and little pain um, <coughs> what otherwise you know, would be really stressful. So that's the other thing that I'm hoping that everyone can internalize. All right, so let's do this lab, and then we'll talk for a few minutes uh, about what to do. Um, surely you'll not get past step three in the lab. Step four and five are somewhat complex.